Well, welcome to Hillcrest Bible Church. I want to open from Psalm chapter 67, verses 3 and 4. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. From the Grace Hymnal this morning, hymn number four, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Grace number four.
bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us that never fails. We're thankful that uh, you're watching over us and uh, that you have rescued us in Christ. We're thankful for the salvation we have only in him. And we pray that as we look at your word and we see that you are a God of judgment and justice as well as a God of grace and salvation, we rejoice in you. And we're so thankful for the blessings that we have in Christ alone. And so we pray that you'll bless our time together. We pray that you would be with uh, those who are sick and those who are suffering. Uh, we pray that your hand would be upon them. We pray that you would be encouraging uh, the people of Hillcrest Bible Church and encourage their hearts and your truth. We pray that you'll be leading their lives and guiding them and keeping them. So we ask your blessing to be upon us and upon our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We live in a troubled world, and we as Christians are not exempt from the trouble. We can have social problems, we can have personal problems, we can have health problems, we can have big problems, we can have little problems. We can have any kind of problem that anyone else in this world can experience. But one thing is certain, and that is that we will in fact face the problems. So the question is not how do we avoid the problems, the question is how do we deal with them. In a very general sense, problems for the Christian can only have one of two, one of two uh, consequences. Problems will either drive you closer to God and affirm your faith and trust in Him, or problems will drive you away from God and disrupt your faith and your life. Satan's purpose in the problems of life is always to make you fail and to make you fall. God's purpose is always to test your faith in order to affirm it so that you stand. So when you encounter difficulties in life and problems in life, draw near to God. He is the creator God. We live in his world. He is the sovereign God. He's in control. And he's the almighty God. He possesses all power to accomplish his purposes. So we draw near to him. We read uh, the word of God and we spend time in prayer. We come before him and we pour out our hearts to him. We depend upon him. We draw near to him. And we determine as, as Christians that this life of dependence is an everyday part of our lives. We fix our hope entirely upon God. And this is never really easy in the world in which we live. We have constant adversaries within us and around us and above us. And I speak of uh, the world and the flesh and the devil. These adversaries always seek to separate us from Jesus Christ and from our Heavenly Father and from the Holy Spirit to separate us from God. And in this life, our connection to God is always a faith connection. And if you talk about the faith connection, you're talking about the believer and also the Word of God and then also the God of the Word because faith is our connection to God. And so our adversaries always attack at these three points. Our faith can be attacked personally, when we're discouraged, when we are depressed, when we face a, a problem or the difficulties in life. We can be challenged as to our faith and trust in God. Our faith can be also challenged at a truth level by denying that the Bible is the Word of God. And our faith can also be really attacked at its source, that source being God. Because God is the God who gives His Word, God is the God who keeps His Word. He's the one who reveals it, He's the one who um, interprets it and applies it in our hearts and lives. So when we stop believing that God will keep His Word, 
Satan is attacking us. The Bible warns us about these strategies. And in particular, the Bible warns about false prophets and about false teachers. And they attack the reality of our faith. They attack the Word of God. They attack God who reveals and interprets and keeps His Word. And God singles out false prophets and false teachers as special objects of His judgment. And that's amazing. God knows how to judge the wicked. He makes that point very clear. And God knows how to protect us and how to rescue us so that we endure and stand firm in the truth. But again, I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. And I want to read this text again because uh, there is a warning that is given concerning these false teachers. Peter is concerned. He's concerned that our faith be growing. He's concerned that our faith um, will be resting upon the infallible truth of God. But he's also concerned with these false teachers and these mockers of the truth. And so he warns the believers in the first century, but he also warns us. And we need to be warned. And we need to hear this warning. You'll notice again the text of Scripture. And it begins with the first three verses, which tells us about these false teachers. And they have no fear of God. They have no respect for the Word of God. And they have no expectation, as we'll continue to read in this passage, they have no expectation that God will come and judge. So they're saying... I'm not afraid of God. I'm not afraid of anything that he has to say. Furthermore, I represent God. And though I don't respect the word of God, I can use the word of God as well to, to teach my false doctrine. And there is no judgment. There's no God. There's no judgment to come that's going to hold me accountable. But you see that. And he, in the first three verses, he says, this is what you're going to face. Noah's coming. But then he says... If God judged, and if God judged, and if God judged, then he knows how to judge. And the three ifs of God judging has to do with the fallen angels, and has to do with Noah and the flood, and has to do with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what Peter is doing is he's going back into the Old Testament, because he says God is the God who reveals the truth, and God is the God who interprets the truth. And so we're going to go back and we're going to look and we're going to see what kind of God that we have. And he's a God who knows how to judge. He knows judgment. We'll talk about that. And he's a God who knows rescue. And we'll talk about that. But to show the reality of what God does with reference to judgment and rescue, he goes first to the, the, the fallen angels who did not keep their proper abode, and they are reserved and kept in a place where God is going to judge them. They've been there since the time prior to the flood. Then we, we look at Noah and uh, the flood uh, and the wickedness that was upon the face of the earth, and God judged the whole of the human race except for Noah, who was rescued, and his family. And then you come to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And once again, God saw the wickedness of man, and here we're talking about immorality and homosexuality. And as an example for the rest of time, God said, I want you to see my judgment here of this wickedness. And so it says, if God knows how to judge the angels, if God knows how to judge the human race prior to the flood, and if God knows how to judge the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, then you should be well aware of the fact that God knows how to judge the false teachers. And He knows how to rescue the righteous. And uh, this is a strong, strong language that is used. So let me read the text. But there were also false prophets among the people, 
even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways. Because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle. And their destruction does not slumber. So here's this strong warning that is given. And then he says, their destruction is not sleeping. It's not waiting. I'm going to get in chapter 3. Uh, the mockers are saying, you know, God is never, He's never coming. He's not coming in the last times. And they even say, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus said He's coming. He's not coming. Everything has existed the way it was before. It's just existing. We're just going on with life. He says, God knows how to judge, and He knows when to judge. Here we have these if statements. Verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. If that's true, and it is. And if He did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. It's the second if or since. And if God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then, we have three ifs, and now the then. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust unto punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. I'm going to look at verses 9 and 10. I'm going to look at the then portion of this text. It begins by saying, the Lord knows. I'm going to give you just about the words of this so that you can piece this together. It says, the Lord knows. When it talks about the Lord knowing and uses this word, wait a minute, it's, it's a word for to know. This means to know in an absolute sense when it's used with reference to God. It means He knows everything about it. He knows in this absolute sense. This is His omniscience applied to this particular issue. And He knows two things. He knows how to rescue, and he knows how to keep under judgment. He knows how to rescue, and he knows how to keep. Now we know that he knows how to rescue, because as believers in Jesus Christ, he's rescued us. That's great truth. So we're thankful when we read about Noah. We're thankful when we read about Lot. And we're thankful that when we read about God, that he knows how to rescue. Now again, when it says that he knows how to rescue, the word that's used for rescue doesn't mean just to take someone who's in trouble out of their trouble. But it really means to take someone who's out of their trouble and draw them to himself. It's, it's again, from the perspective of the rescuer. So he knows how to, and it doesn't just mean I'm taking this person out of trouble and setting them over here so they're out of trouble. But God knows how to take that person to himself. He needs, knows how to draw to oneself. He knows how to rescue the godly. Those who are devoted to Him. Again, this word for godly is not a word where the word God is in that, but it's always used with reference to God. But it's really a word that speaks of devotion to God. That are wholly believing and trusting in Him. Who are devoted to Him. And the Scriptures always encourage us in our own Christian life, to be more and more devoted to God day by day. And he knows how to rescue the godly from their temptations. And again, this temptation can be a word that's used of God when it's used with reference to God. It's a test used to affirm our faith. 
When it's used with reference to Satan, it's a, it's a stumbling block that's used to destroy our faith. It's used to damage and to hurt and to harm and to destroy. So we look at this word and we say, well, I certainly don't want to fall under the influence of Satan, but it's, it's one of the, the choice parts of this passage is the Lord knows how to rescue you. The Lord knows how to rescue you. And in fact, the Lord's love for you never fails. So the Lord is always rescuing you. And as I was thinking about that, I thought about the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry. Because there were many instances when God rescued Jesus Christ. And uh, there are times when it says, and the people were all angry with the Lord Jesus Christ, or there were Pharisees or those who were leaders who wanted to go and rest and and uh, grab the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, prevent him from engaged in the kind of ministry. And it, it says something like, and he walked through their midst. And I always, when I see that, I go, oh, I'd like to know what that looks like. You know, it's like, I mean, here, here's all this trouble going on. Maybe things are stirring around. And, and I don't think he was going around. So he probably just walked right through. And, you know, they're all looking around for him. And they don't, he's gone. And Jesus had many wonderful moments in his ministry. It was a ministry of rejection. But he spoke and he preached with authority. Those were great moments. And there also were times when there were people who were hurting and oppressed. And he healed them. I think we've all been in the presence of someone who was sick or someone who was dying. And you look at that and you go, Dear Lord, would you please heal this person? It would be wonderful if we had the power and the authority to heal. But Jesus had the power and authority, and there were those who were not only sick, but even in instances who died, and he was able to raise them from the dead. These are triumphant moments. But every situation in Jesus' life where God rescued him, there was a time when God also took him through the trials. In fact, his whole ministry was going through trials. But when it comes to the cross... God the Father did not deliver him from the testing. He took him through the testing. Took him through the testing. And I always think it's significant that the Old Testament scripture says that none of his bones were broken. And that just aside, it's almost like an aside comment from the Old Testament. But when it's applied to the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's there on the cross, it's as if God said, okay, you have... You have taken Jesus Christ. You have crucified him. I poured out my wrath upon him. Now he has paid the penalty, paid in full. No more. That's it. We're not going to break the body. And you, know, you look at that and you say, well, what difference would it have made? And the answer is, it wouldn't have made any difference other than God said, it, will, it stops here. It, it, it's really a picture of God saying, okay, enough is enough. It, this, is, this is where we're drawing on. He took Jesus through everything that was required for him to accomplish the eternal salvation of everyone who was saved. To the point where then God said, that's, that's it. That's it, no more. And so, God is always rescuing us, drawing us to himself in afflictions and difficulties. And ultimately, every problem that you have ever had is going to be resolved when you stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every difficulty, every problem, every obstacle that you've ever had in life will be resolved for you at that time. So the Lord knows how to rescue. He's well acquainted with that. A perfect rescue at the cross. But the Lord also knows judgment. The Lord knows how, it says. By the way, this word knows. Let me just describe this word just a little bit more. But the word knows is in the perfect tense. The perfect tense in Greek is like taking the present tense and the past tense and putting them together. Past tense means if he knows something. 
But the present aspect of that means he knows something and he continues to know it. Using this word know. It means a past action with the effects that are continuing all the way up in the present. Another example of that is when the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. That's the perfect tense. So he said, when Christ was crucified, I was crucified. And the effects of that continue right up in the present. So some of the translations will say, I have been crucified with Christ, which emphasizes that past. Some will say, I am crucified with Christ which emphasizes the present aspect of that. But that's why it's, the translators struggle with the perfect tense because it's a past action with present effects. And when it says God knows, it means He knows back when the angels sinned. He knows back in the flood. He knows at Sodom and Gomorrah. And He knows now. And He knows how to rescue and He knows how to judge. The word for use here is to keep His eye on as a guard or as a warden, to keep people under punishment, to reserve them for punishment on the day of judgment. And perhaps that's a reference to the judgment day that's, that's Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment, when all of the wicked will be raised from the dead and will stand before this great white throne. And they will be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll be the only thing that is of concern to them at that particular time. And God says, that judgment is reserved for false teachers, for the false prophets of the Old Testament scriptures, reserved in a special way. The wicked will all be judged, but there's, it's, it's this special word, and I think I wanna ask just a, a couple of questions here just to sort of emphasize this being kept for judgment. One of the questions is why the special judgment for false teachers. Why is it that they are compared to the fallen angels and compared to the antediluvian wicked and to Sodom and Gomorrah? And the answer to that is because their attack is a direct attack upon God and His Word and the people of God. It's a direct attack upon all that God is doing. Because God's purpose is His promises and for people to believe Him. And Satan jumps in. And the devil jumps in and says, I'm going to interrupt that connection. God is always interested in breaking the connection that we have with God. Always. And so it's as if this special judgment is announced upon these false teachers. The second question I want to to ask is, how do they go about their deception? How do they go about it? And I want to give you three things to say about this. One is they, they always appeal to the old nature. They appeal to the natural man. Our wants and desires. They oftentimes can speak in when times are difficult and they have opportunity to uh, speak about uh, when we're weak, and they come in with appealing to our fleshly desires. That's, that's a key part of the, what the text says about them, but it's a key part of their, the way in which they impact. This fleshly desires can be sinful desires, it can be desires of things that you would want. The appeal is to both. But the other thing that is notable, the second thing that's notable about these is what I call subtle subtraction. Subtle subtraction. And I mean by that, it's a sneaky perversion of the Word of God. Because false teachers want to be perceived as teachers of the Word of God. They want to be perceived as those who represent God. And they want to say, I'm an ambassador of, of, of Jesus Christ, and I'm proclaiming the truth of God. And they, they then engage in this subtle subtraction of the truth. And I can give you just a couple quick examples of that, but the serpent with Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the serpent comes to Eve, the serpent being Satan and the devil himself, the slanderer. And he says, indeed has God said, 
You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. God said you can eat from all the trees of the garden. But there's one tree that you are not to eat of. This is a tree that will show your faith and trust and your loyalty and your love for me. You don't eat of that one tree. God is God. He's the sovereign God. He's the creator. Man is given authority over the whole of the earth. Dominion over the whole of the earth. But not dominion over God. So God says there's one thing, that tree right there, I don't want you to eat from it. I want you to show your love and obedience to me on the tree level right there. So Eve answers the question. She said, well, God said we can eat of all the trees, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we should not eat of it, we shouldn't even touch it. She probably got that from Adam, but should, you can't even touch it. Because we will die. You will surely die. That's where Satan then comes with this subtle subtraction. And he says, you shall not die. You shall not die. Because God knows... God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. God indeed knows good and evil. He doesn't know it by experience. God knows that good is everything related to God, and everything that is evil is when you turn away and go away from God. Everything that is contrary to God is evil. God knows that. God knows good and evil better than, than we will ever know good and evil. Because he has an absolute knowledge of all of these things. But God knows what good and evil is. And you won't be like God if you sin. Because you will not be one who has this total knowledge of absolute understanding of good and evil. But you'll be one who has an experiential knowledge of it. And it will be a, an authority over you in that you will be a sinner and you will be under the curse of death. Spiritual death, physical death, eternal death. So the devil is taking God's truth and just turning it in such a way that sort of questions the goodness of God. He's not going to give you all the trees to eat. Why would he just take, why would he take a tree away from you? And God, there's, God really doesn't want you to be like him. And just remember, what happens when we are saved? God says, I'm going to make you like Christ. I'm going to make you like the Son of God. We're going to be as much like the Son of God as we can possibly be and still not be God. We're going to be the creatures. We're always the creatures. But God's purpose has always been that we should be like Him. That's just a lie. But it's couched in such a way, it's a subtle subtraction of the truth related to God. And the serpent really stands as God's representative in the garden, speaking the things of God. The serpent also came, the devil, the slanderer, and spoke to Jesus Christ. When Jesus was hungry, when he was at a point of weakness, this is a physical weakness, Jesus Christ encountered physical weakness, but here he is, he was fasting, he was weak, the temptation, and uh, Satan comes to him and says, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, this is at his beginning of his ministry, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, is it wrong for Jesus Christ to change stones into bread? The answer is no. Is it not, not any more wrong than it would be for Jesus to take water and change the nature of water into wine? Because he can change anything that he wants to change, but he always wants to do the will of God. And if it is not the will of God for these stones to be turned into bread, he's not going to do that. And so he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So he says, no, I'm not going to do that. So then Satan takes him and places him in a place, and he says, if if you are the son, in the temple, he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, here's subtle subtraction. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, 
And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Psalm 91. That's a messianic psalm. You want to know if you're the Son of God? See if the messianic shoe fits your foot. So cast yourself down. Because God says if you're the Messiah, you will not be hurt. You will not be damaged. Death had no claim upon Jesus Christ. So for him to cast himself down, I really don't know what would happen, but he wasn't about to do that because it would have been disobedient to God. That would have been the first thing that he did that was contrary to God's will. God's will was not for him to follow Satan and do these things. And he says, you shall not test the Lord God. When God gives his word, he doesn't give the word so that we'll be able to test. He gives the word of God so that we will know the truth. So that we will believe. So he takes the Bible and he twists it around and he uses it in such a way that if you would do what he said, you'd be disobedient to God. That's subtle subtraction. And then finally he says, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. That's not so subtle. But after doing these subtle subtraction steps, he comes to the place where he gives this, this final and the, the ultimate. What he would want is for, the, for God to bow down before him. And he says, be gone. For you shall worship the Lord God alone. I don't know if this is just mixing truth and error. We don't have long, but let me just say, there's, there's a number of examples of mis, mixing truth and error. And you can take the social gospel, which uh, at the beginning of the last century, and uh, it's, it's said, you know, what is really important and what the gospel message is, is that we love one another and that we have a, a social relationship with others. And so the idea of loving others and loving your neighbor and loving, you know, that is the essence of what the gospel is. And the problem with that and the problem with won't take the time, but the prosperity gospel that then came, the idea that if you become a Christian, everything will go well with you, and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And then we have the justice gospel that sees people who are being afflicted, and they're in difficulty, and they're suffering, and help the poor, and help the weak, and help those that are helpless. And you can have all kinds of, of, of gospel messages, but the reason why these are false teachings is not because loving others and being blessed by God and helping people who are in trouble is a bad thing. The, the, the reason why it's a false teaching is because it replaces the main thing. And it replaces the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the gospel of Jesus Christ gets replaced, whatever is happening is wrong. We even had someone come along recently with a new, the New Paul perspective. And the New Paul perspective was saying, you know, the reformers really understood the doctrine of justification by faith. Because they were responding to the works idea of salvation. When really the idea of justification should be against the Judaizers. Who felt like he had to become a part of the nation of Israel to be saved. And that they were the grace they were saved because they were a part of that nation. If you're going to be saved you have to come and be under the law. Be under the Judaizers. And, and, and that's the way. And so these new Paul perspective people end up denying the Reformation truth that was established, which was really the biblical truth that is reestablished, that we're not saved by, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. It's a wrong view of justification. But I can tell you that the website where I get all of my uh, online books from has all the online books of this view of justification there. False views, false teaching. And instead of standing up as this website saying, you know, we're not going to have that false teaching, it's there. It's subtle. And the people who teach that are very nice people. Very nice people. False teachers, but very nice people. It's a subtle departure from the truth. 
Notice the last words here, and I'll be done. It says, and especially those who indulge the flesh. So it always appeals to the desires that you have. Even sinful desires, but fleshly desires. It appeals on the level of having something. Health, wealth, and success. Justice. Loving others. And it appeals and puts things in the wrong emphasis. So you have in this statement, especially those who indulge the flesh in corrupt desires, which is the sensual behavior. And the second thing that's mentioned here is rebellious behavior. And the natural heart is in rebellion against God. And so those who despise authority, they look down with contempt upon the word we use for authority here is lordship. Is the Lord. The, the, the fact that we're legally owned and, and God has legal dominion over us. And so to despise this God who has ownership over us and to just to appeal to our sensual desires, false teaching always comes to us on that level. And the, the passage says, God knows how to judge that. We live in a wicked world. We live with the blessings of God in a wicked world. But God says, I will judge. I always know that we live in a wicked world where it seems like people get away with wickedness all the time. But the Bible says, no one ever gets away with anything. God knows how to judge. And He knows how to rescue. And when we look at this passage of Scripture, we should pray, Dear God, deliver us from false doctrine. Deliver us from false teaching. Help us to measure our faith by the Word of God. And by the God who keeps His Word. Help us to be faithful to Him. And help us to beware of those subtle changes which lead you off into a different direction where you soon find yourself to be away from Christ and from God, and from the Bible, and you're out on your own. We go through difficult times, even through all this pandemic and all the things that are taking place. Satan is always an opportunist. He always likes to use situations for his own purposes. Always beware. The Lord's people should always be careful that we're standing on the truth of God's Word. We should always be careful to be relying upon the Lord in prayer. Realizing that our strength and our weakness and our knowledge is limited. We need His help. We need His hand to be upon us. So let us take these words of Scripture and take them to heart. Peter is not just talking about first century Christianity. He's talking about Christianity at all times. May God help us to be faithful to Him. Let's bow in prayer. Holy Father, we thank You. For the love that you have for us. We are not deserving of your love. The fact that you love us. The fact that you rescued us. And, and you draw us to yourself. Is so amazing to us. Because we see ourselves. No different from anyone else. And yet you saved us. Lord we pray that you will. Strengthen our hearts to be faithful to you. Give us wisdom and understanding. With reference to your truth. And cause us to be faithful day by day, to you, to the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may your strength and power be manifested in us. We thank you for this time, and we pray your blessing to be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> Amen. From the Trinity Hymnal, number 724, Only Trust Him, Trinity 724.
Grace Hymnal number 437. Grace 437. 